within the last 10 days or so, there was a break-in in a shoe store in... I knew it. Shoeaholic over there. We, when we think of break-ins, we think of pictures. We think of that or the next one. I've done repairs on things like that. And then I had a car one time that somebody decided they needed the baseball bat that was in the floorboard of the, my van. I'd taken my family to a theater to watch some movie. I, all of us were in there, and we came out the wing window. These Remember wing windows? <laughs> the blue Ford van I used to have, somebody busted out the wing window, and it was shattered, so they had some special tool that would break that safety glass and shattered in a million pieces, and I reached in, looked inside, and the baseball bat was missing. It was a $40 bat, I guess, but uh, somebody wanted it worse than I did. Matthew 6.19 says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Because we're talking about God breaking in. And here's break-ins usually don't work the way God does. John 10.10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. Break-ins are usually to take something you do not own without permission. God breaks in to give, not to get. Now, God broke into prehistory by creating history. History is his story. Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth, spoke them into existence. How can you prove it? Can't prove it, but logic certainly doesn't suggest evolution. You can't get something from nothing. Something from nothing doesn't work. That's provable, repeatable. So I, I read a story and I saw a blurb about a, a megachurch pastor in the Southern Baptist denomination who after many years of being this mega church pastor and writing Sunday school curriculum, felt he was called to preach when he was 16, went to the ministry and served many years, decided that he, he was an atheist. So he obviously forsook the pastorate and is now out trying to convert people to the non-God crowd. Think of what a misguided soul. He did not believe that he was crucified with Christ. He was upset the way the church treats people. Well, so am I. But I, I know there are doctors who practice malfeasance. I still go to one. I know at times people have gotten bad gas from certain gas stations. I still put gas in my car. When God broke in and created everything, he was using various means. It, of course, at the beginning, he spoke it all into existence and made it that way and sustained it. But throughout history, he's broken in with prophetic words, prophets who regularly heard from God and would declare, this is what God says. I'm, I'm always stuck with the King James Version, what says, thus saith the Lord. And there are a lot of churches who still speak that way. It's their, their form of Christianese. And if God was speaking to us today, he wouldn't say, thus saith. He would say, yo. <laughs> or, hey, dude. <laughs> I'm not sure how casual he would be, but it would be in the language of the day. So, there's nothing sacred about the King James Version of the Bible. What's sacred is what comes from the mind of God. And we would do well to listen, to heed, and to obey. But God spoke by prophets. God intersected or broke into our world of time and space 
by certain events. Do you remember a thing called the flood? Remember a thing called the plagues of Egypt? Miracles. Eventually, God broke in, sending his very own son. God became flesh. Born among us. That he might live a sinless life in the power of the Spirit. Subject to every temptation you and I are subject to, except without sin. So that his sacrifice, the death of his life, his shedding of his blood, would be the penalty payment for our sin, for mankind's sin. He became man that he could die for man, that man could be forgiven. And all of the sins of the world forever were paid for when Jesus died. However, you must appropriate that to you personally. It's your gift. If you don't take it, you lose. If somebody died and left you a gazillion dollars and you never claimed it, Too bad, so sad, you're dead. God still breaks in to our time and space in the day in which we live. His, his, the Bible, nobody carries a Bible anymore. I've got one in here and I've got one in my phone. I've got a lot of it in here. But the Bible has got power in it. Its words have power. And if you believe what he said, it, it takes hold and produces something powerful in your life. God is still breaking in. His power is in his words. The gifts of the Holy Spirit still operate today. I I know there's a section of the church that struggles with that. Uh, For one reason, they're theologically uh, confused. But another reason is that many, I'll I'll say it this way. I'll use this phrase. uh, Full gospel. It's like there's, um, that's not even a good phrase. There's a side of the church that calls themselves full gospel, meaning that they haven't agreed with the notion that the gifts died with the last apostle. They think Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Anything Jesus or God ever did, he still does. He's not limited by our um, location on the, on the timeline. God's not limited in any way. God is all-powerful, right? Right? all-knowing, omniscient, knows everything. He's omnipresent. He can be anywhere and everywhere all at the same time. And he's all-powerful. And, he, and, and there's nothing and no one like him. So God can do anything, anywhere, anytime, any way he wants. And it'll all be for his glory. But we who move in that understanding, a part of those people have gotten ahead of God and been a little bit wacky. And in claiming to be moving in the spirit, they've moved in the flesh, and it's, it's just distasteful. And it's turned many people off. I just want to say right here, keep your eyes on Jesus. Read the Bible. Let that be your authority. God has many representatives or people who claim to be his representatives. They don't all do so well. There are probably times I haven't done very well. You find that hard to believe, I know. I'll bet there's times you haven't done very well. We won't talk about those. Because what I know is this. Even when you and I are not faithful, even when we are doubters, God is still faithful. I read a story about David Wilkerson, who was so discouraged, the the financial burden was so huge, and he just didn't feel like he was getting anywhere. He just said, Lord, I just, I give up. I've been praying for over a week for these needs to be met, and I just, I'm tired. Lord, I just give up. So he said, I got in my car. He was living in Texas at the time. He's driving along, and, and it's like he heard God in the backseat. He said, where are you going? He says, I'm just going to go down to Mexico. Nobody will know me, and I can witness uninterrupted. I can share Jesus. Nobody will bother me. And God says, that's not my plan for you. Turn around and go back. He said, Lord, I don't want to. God said, if you drive five more miles, I'm leaving you, and you're on your own. He said, that scared the out of me. So he said, I turned around. He said, and about a week later, all the things I've been praying about all unfolded and came to pass. That if I'd have hung on a few more days, I would have seen God work in answer to my praying. God answered in spite of my lack of faith. 
So even when you're not faithful, God is still working. His plan for you is still in motion. God's not going to give up just because you did. God's not going to quit. God has a plan. God has a destiny for you. It was in your, when you, when you were born, matter of fact, before you were born, God had a plan for your life. And it doesn't matter if you are currently in it or not. Well, it doesn't matter to this extent. And here's what I want to say. God is still going to accomplish his will. You can choose to go along or you can choose to be left out. Choice is yours. However, God knows what you'll choose. And he knows when you'll choose. And he knows whether or not you're just discouraged. And whether or not you've just cashed in and said, I give up, I quit. God knows. But he didn't. He didn't quit. He didn't cash in and he won't. The God of all peace and all comfort is still watching over you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit still operate. And we'll continue to do that because of Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Until he comes either for his saints or with his saints. Depending on your version of how things wrap up. Matthew 24. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now those to whom he came the first time missed it. They didn't know how to read the signs. John 1.10 He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. So, a little history. God calls Abraham and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And all of Abraham's lineage are the Jews. And here they are waiting for this promised Savior, this promised Messiah. He comes and they don't recognize him. Matter of fact, they didn't just not recognize him. They rejected him. They didn't just slough him off. They rejected outright, violently, vehemently, vociferously. I can't think of any of the V words. So I was being a Baptist right there without all that alliteration. If they'd have rhymed, it would have been even better. Yeah. Sorry. I'm doing the best I can being a non-Baptist. But he came. His own people rejected him. Had him crucified. Tried to give the Romans reason, but the Romans didn't want to kill him. So they let the Jews decide. And they said, well, then give us Barabbas. Crucify him. So Jesus was crucified at the behest of the Jews, the people he came to be among and to rescue and to be their Savior. But God, knowing that, Jesus, knowing that, came anyway. Millions are going to miss him again. He's coming another time. Millions are going to miss him. Jesus is not Santa Claus. Jesus is not the spirit of Christmas. He's the reason we have a Christmas. It is Christmas. So it's not happy holiday. Holiday would mean holy day. So those who are trying to escape St. Christmas are playing dumb because they are holiday means a holy day but it's not just any day that's holy it's the day we celebrate the birth of Jesus is it the day he was born no do we care no is it a big deal no it is not is the church wrong it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if the calendar's wrong it makes no difference whatsoever it's the day that we decide we're going to celebrate the day Jesus was born how do we get to that day? It doesn't matter. I don't care how the day came about. I don't care about the history of how they chose Christmas Day. I don't care. Just like I don't care about Easter. All I care is that Jesus rose from the dead and what that means. So today we focus on December 25 because that's the day God broke in in a tangible way himself. 
And God breaks in on his schedule, not yours or mine. And God breaks in for his glory, his purpose, not yours or mine. Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And it reads on, born of a virgin, under the law, that those under the law might be redeemed and set free from the curse of the law of sin and death, blah, blah, blah. Galatians 4. Another way God broke in, God sent his angel Gabriel. Gabriel said, I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to you. He sent Gabriel to Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist. There you go, Baptist. (laughs) Then that same angel went and appeared to Mary, the would-be mother of Jesus. And then an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. We don't know if it's the same angel, but it was in a dream. And then um, an angel showed up to talk to shepherds on the hillside. Don't you know they were shocked? Black of night, and there's an angel. And then he said, don't be afraid. And he talks along, and then suddenly, I love God's suddenly. Suddenly, there's a whole host, a whole number of the heavenly host, it says. A, a whole choir, if you will. A whole Pardon me, flock of angels. Flock of sheep. Anyway, so much for the pun. A lot of angels appeared, and they're praising God. And the shepherds go, well, we got to go see if this is true. And somehow, I don't think they said, can you watch our sheep? We're going to be gone a while. I don't think they said that. They just trusted the sheep to not stray, and they trusted there would be no wild critters to come get their sheep. But it didn't matter. They had a more important mission. Even though they were there to guard the sheep, stay with them, they said, oh, this is far greater. An angelic appearance is motivating us to go to Bethlehem and see. After the Magi had traveled from the east to see this king of the Jews, and after they'd inquired of Herod, he said, when you find him, come back and tell me so that I too can go. And they, after they'd seen the baby, being warned in a dream. I don't know if it was an angel or if God spoke to them, but in a dream, God intersected or interrupted or broke in. It said, change your plan. Go home another route. Take a different way. Don't go back that way through Jerusalem. Go another way. Take I-40 instead of I-15 or whatever. Now, I suspect most of you have a story of where God interrupted your life. I just told you about David Wilkerson's story. I have a story or two. I'll bet you have one as well. Where God changed the direction, changed your trajectory. I read Friday, I think it was, a story about an asteroid that was uh, theoretically headed toward our orbit and maybe would hit our Earth. And so scientists got together and launched a satellite to intersect and hit that thing. And I forget the size of the, of the object, maybe the size of a grand piano or something like that, traveling at 144,000 miles per hour, hit that rock and altered its course just a little so that it missed our orbit. You can interrupt, break in, and change your trajectory. Sometimes, I was talking with somebody last week, Thursday, I think, how that songs have power in them. The marriage of a melody and a message sometimes sticks far long after you've heard a sermon. God will bring that up at a key moment. Sometimes I'll have a song to come that I haven't sung in 50 years. That's why Pam goes, tell me about it. (laughs) These songs just come. They're in there somewhere. Sometimes I'm in the car alone and suddenly a song will come out. God has a way of powerfully intersecting your life. His word put to music is powerful, but his word out of the printed word, the Bible, 
that word from God preached under the anointing is powerful. There have been certain sermons that I've heard that I knew were directed right to me. God read my mail. God can do that. He, he knows every thought you're thinking. There are no secrets with God. And one day, everything will be made manifest. But until then, God is so gracious and so merciful. He gives you the invitation to come and let him break into your life. I want you to be open all the time for God's break in. Leave the door of your heart unlocked. Let God in. If he wants in, let him in. I wonder how long did you miss his input into your life before you made the decision to surrender. Some of you went a long time. There are many times you heard God knocking. There are many times somebody spoke to you. I, I think of a few people that I was directly responsible for their conversion. I was at the right place at the right time. And I knew I knew, I, I felt it. I knew there was a, a powerful battle going on in their mind. And I could tell that this moment was history making. And God let me be there for that. And a few people come to mind. But uh, truth is, very often when I speak, I have no way to know how powerful of an impact it would be. I heard from somebody this past week that I haven't seen in over 20 years. This person said, whenever I go to church, I hear you and Pam sing in my head. She said, and first that comes to mind is Robe of Righteousness. She meant the song we sang this morning. I am covered over with a robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to me. The impact of that has carried through the years and been a sustaining force in her life. What a precious thing to share with me. I, I believe that God anoints his word. And all that's left to do is for you and I to say, Lord, break in. Break in here. Lord, come. Come, oh, come, Emmanuel. I wonder if we're still missing cues from him. One day soon, he's going to break in for the last time. When he does, there will be a breaking away. Gravity's going to let go, and we're out of here. Believers will be united with Christ forever. But until then, we should be willing to break out in praise. We should break the chains of darkness everywhere we can. Break the chains of ignorance everywhere we can. Break the bonds of uh, hatred and all, all the stuff that the world is so full of. Let's you and me decide. No, let's just praise him. Because where the praises of God are, he establishes a throne. So when the church sings and praises and worships, something about God's rule shows up. When God breaks in, he breaks us out. He sets us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed, John eight thirty six. He breaks or he has already broken Satan's power. Hebrews 2.14, because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who had lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We have no more fear of dying. If we get to die, we get to go be with Jesus. But he has not asked us to die physically now he's asked us to die to self now that he might live through us that's why he came so let Jesus break in we sing a song sometimes he set me free bound by chains of bondage of sin let him set you free it's why he came are you dead to self let him deliver you you have angst. Um, 
let me just rabbit trail here for a second. Many people in this world, even church people, have what are called mental health issues. Why? Because they haven't yet decided to believe everything God said in the Word. Dead people don't have mental health issues. Dead people don't have desires that are unfulfilled. Those are live people. Those are people who are carnal, who are trying to live after the desires of their flesh. But if you've died with Christ, what did he come to do? To give himself a ransom for many. He came to deliver the oppressed and heal the brokenhearted. He came to set those people free. Free from what? Free from yourself. Free from all those clamorings that come from within. So Jesus, come break in. Help me see how free I am. Lord, we thank you for your word. It has power. And if we would muster just a little bit of faith to believe it, our life would change dramatically. Thank you, Lord, that you came to rescue anyone who would listen. Anyone who can call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't turn any of us away. It's not how good we've been. It's who are we going to become through the strength of your power. Lord, we are all powerless to become anything other than a failure. But you, living through us, <laughs> there's, there's nothing that can defeat us if we're living your plan. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us, proved it by dying in our place, paid our debt, our penalty for sin, paid it freely, and here we are today, enjoying the liberty and the freedom that you have brought. Help us, Lord, to share that good news this Christmas. Not so getting caught up in the hustle and bustle, but instead just taking a breath and living as free we, we don't have to have anything. We don't have to do anything. So, Lord, we just love everybody we see. Love people through us, Lord. And we thank you for that. We give you praise and thanks. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.